that it's not ground, even though it looks like it would be ground as well. So Infineon's done some real kind of interesting tricks. And I mean, security is built in layers. So every little thing that they've done enhances them, you know, one more, one more level above everybody else. So the mesh on the old device that was 250, this is a good example uh, for you to see just how small it really is. This is what the entire uh, top surface is, is covered in. So you've got these little wires. These wires, these wires are 500 um, nanometers wide. It sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's very small. We're, we're being spoiled by Intel and AMD with 32 nanometers and you know 40 nanometers and all that stuff today because it, you know this is this is very this is very small. Uh, you, know. you can see on the old device you could actually see where the mesh came up and down underneath. So this is metal four. This is the top uh, layer of metal on this mesh. So we got to somehow get through this to get to the data bus. Because the data bus, once we find the data bus, is buried underneath. And this is the reason that I showed you these pictures in the beginning. I had showed you the, the substrates with this mesh stripped off. Do you, do you recall that? I'll bring it back up. We, you've got to study these with the mesh removed first, know where you need to go. And then once you know where you need to go, for example, we need to get into area three. Now you've got this mesh going up and uh, left and to the left and the right of the chip over everything. So you've got to plan your attack and, you, and it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. To get through the mesh, it took me about two months. It took me about two weeks to figure out what I wanted to do. And then it took me two months to get it down, to get it, you know, to, to polish the technique. Um, because you can see you can't, on the new chips, you can't see anything below. Um, so here's a close-up again of the older 250 nanometer mesh. Same principle, I just used the picture to kind of give you a good, a good, a real close image of it. It was clear. Now here's an image of the mesh in the fib. Can everybody see that? It's pretty dark. Can you see it? So this is in a focused on beam workstation. This is an electron, an electron microscope image of the, uh, of the device at a tilt. So now you can really see these wires. So on the new device, these wires are 400 nanometers uh, wide. And you can't see below because the glass, it's, you can see below if you dip it in, in uh, hydrofluoric acid for, let's say like, well, it depends on your solution, but in my solution, in my environment, 30 seconds will um, remove enough of the top layer of oxide that the glass is uh, in the in between two wires. There's there's it's an optical illusion with the, with the uh, the way the glass has been poured and it, it fell in, and so a dip for about 30 seconds in my lab environment will remove most of the glass. It's still present. The mesh is still present, but most of that passivation layer has been removed. But this is what so this is what you're looking at though when you're in the fib. Um, or when you're optically too, even. And this is 6,500 magnification to see this this big. Can everybody see it? Can you see it okay on the projector? Can we dim the lights, actually? Because some of the pictures are going to be, uh, a lot of the pictures are going to be from the fib. Does anybody have questions so far? Yes? It's, um, it depends. If you go to EAG on the West Coast, uh, or they used to be known as uh, or MIFIS up in Lake Forest, they're brought out by, by EAG now. Uh, it's $350 an hour. There's a problem with that, though. The problem is the operator is really good, and he probably is. Is anybody here a FIB operator? Does anybody here run one? Uh, you know. God bless them. But <laughs> they, most of the time, they're used to working with the mask set from the manufacturer. So Broadcom comes into them, and they have a, they have a, a piece of software called Knights, and they load the actual mask set that the developer of the device made, and then they know they have an overlay basically on the screen. They, here's, you know, here's that fib image, and then they, they've overlaid optically with color where they need to go in the chip. They know what, what line is where, what layer it's on, and it's, uh, it's, it's wild. And for me, I have to make that mask set myself using a, a mix of optical and fib images, which we're going to go through that. Um, what's a time check, Jeff? Yeah, this... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But if if any again, if anybody needs, just ask me, and I'll I'll pause and what you know. Go ahead. 
Um, I can get you one. I, I don't have one. It's got a Grand Idea Studio thing right there on where my water sits, though. <laughs> I'll take your picture for you. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, this is the this is the match. I mean, this is crazy. So you've got twenty. You've got five zones. You've got four wires per four. You know, four circuits per zone. Not four wires. Four circuits. There's over a thousand wires going across the die. On the TPM, it's still a thousand wires across the die, and they just got very long. They, you know, the, the length it grew, it's, it's twice the length of this die right here. So if this die is two millimeters, the TPM is four millimeters long, like four by one, uh, which is a pretty large die. They're packing a lot of stuff into it. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, yeah, we're just beginning, everybody. <laughs> so, so now we got to get through the mesh, so we've got to figure out, you know, first, A, where do we want to go, and then B, can we keep it within a sector? I really, you know, the first thing I thought was how do I just bypass this mesh 100% and get and, and just neutralize it? And I looked on the edge of the die and I saw what used to be loops, loopbacks. So you had a loopback in the upper corner and a loopback in the lower corner opposite of it. And I realized that when they saw the, the die, the die so off the wafer, uh, they cut those loopbacks. And I always wondered, and I still wonder to this date, if that puts the mesh into some type of a bypass where the mesh can be removed and it's in kind of a loopback, like your loopback on a Linux box or whatever. And um, I don't know. That's another one of these things to, to follow up on down the road. Um, but with the technique that I have today, um, the mesh might as well not even be there. Infineon better come up with something new because this is, it, it's, it takes me about an hour to bridge it. And once it's bridged, uh, it takes me about six hours to dig out. So if you do the math on the, it w how much it would cost you, if the operator is capable of getting everything dug out, like you're going to see, because this took time. This is what really made it take six months. Um, it took me about two months to actually get the process down of digging out these holes that you're going to see. And because I'm actually going to expose the metal two track, through the, right through the mesh. So I'm going to make a big hole and then clean this hole up really good. And then I'm going to make a smaller hole in the big hole. And you know, the chip is, is, is like a sandwich of layers. And I'll, I'm going to show that. It's, it's coming. And so you've got to be very careful. One, one second, you know, you pick up your drink and not, pay, not paying attention. And you've all of a sudden burned right through and exposed a track that you wanted to not have exposed. You know, or it just depends what you're up to. But, and then you're back to the drawing board, start over. When these things die, it, it really stinks because I, I just don't want to, you know, do it again. I want to <laughs> one, do one and, and be done with it. So right here, this is actually where sector one, let's pretend, ends and sector two begins. And so you, what I did was I used a gas called xenon difluoride. Anybody familiar with xenon difluoride? Xenon difluoride is a very powerful uh, etch enhancer. So they call it IEE uh, if you use like an FEI fib. And so using the IEE, basically it, it, excites, the etch, the et, it, it excites the etching of uh, silicon, uh, of any type of silicon oxide, and it preserves aluminum. It also preserves copper. So it's, it's pretty much you can think of it as it preserves metals, and it, but it etches, uh, it etches glass. Any type of oxide it gets its hands on, it etches very fast, like a 7 to 1 ratio um, compared to without it. Without the gas, I would have just milled away these wires. With the gas, I milled, the, milled, milled and showed the wires, and then I kept going. So it actually, the glass is under each wire still, but the beam milled away in between the wires. And then what do we see? We see metal three, the interconnects to the mesh lines. So otherwise, you'd never know where, how this, where, you know, this, uh, let me see. You'd, you'd never know that this wire really goes to this wire. But guess what? It doesn't. It just looks like it does. Because Infineon's pretty smart. They, um, this is a crossover of, me of, of hypothetically sectors one into sectors two of the five sectors. So you really can't tell in the fib that this doesn't connect to there. But, it, but optically, right now, it looks like it. But norm so if, as long as you're not on the sector edge, you can, you can trust this, the fib image that, you know, um, that, this, that this tube connected to this tube. But, but, but there's exceptions, like I was just saying, on this, on this very border right here. So lucky for us, all our edits are right in the middle of, the, of a sector. I, I call it sector three. So you can see, when you, when you have a problem with the fib, you got to mix your tools. So here's, here's, this, here's a device that I wet etched with hydrofluoric, wet etched it down, um, and basically now you can see it's, it's rough, Don't ignore all this, but you can see right here, here's the, the remnants in the glass where the um, metal three interconnect, interconnects were, and metal four.